It's a good morning to you all. Welcome to Asake Online. My name is Zenzi and David. This is the Breakfast Club. Today in the program, we'll be talking to Novio Rosa Chuma, an author. And some of you, I think you have read reviews of uh, heard about the book. And uh, a lot have been said about uh, this uh, book, but she wrote a book called uh, The House of Stone. And today we'll be talking to her to find out exactly what motivated her. What's the book? I've heard so many stories, I've read so many interesting views and reviews about this book and I really can't wait to read it and, and find more. But we are very fortunate and lucky uh, to, to have her in the program today. Uh, welcome to Zimbabwe and to the program. <laughs> I thank and, you, Zenzile. It's good to be back yeah. and thank you for having me in the breakfast show. Yeah, for, um, I've been following your work from Ama Documentaries with keen interest, so it's really so, exciting with you. We're talking right now. So when you get to Mkabu Airport and you're getting out of the plane and you're saying finally in Bulawa and mm -hmm. in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. what do you feel? What do you... You know, I haven't... I, I could actually... It, it didn't rain, but I could smell some sort of rain in the air. I don't know if it was my psychology. I haven't been home in three years. So for me to be coming home and especially launching the novel, it's, it's, it feels very um, emotional for me. Um, and I think the act of writing a book, even undertaking any sort of project, a historical project, sort of changes you. So I, I think I'm seeing home, at least with the strangeness or freshness. But um, one thing, it's nice to be hearing Uli um, yeah. Milo to be speaking Debele, hearing Debele. And, yeah. Probably my question before we even talk to you personally. Mm. I mean, mm. now you have written a book up which talks about the history of Zimbabwe and you're mm. back here. Mm. Do you look at it the same or you're looking like you're seeing a crime scene or something? <laughs> I look at it, it feels a bit strange. And also, um, you know, <laughs> there are layers to Zimbabwe. It's our history, I feel it's, 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 it's in plain sight, but not, also not in plain sight. And so uh, there are things I'm thinking about, layers to this place that uh, are not on the surface or apparent. You know, it's holiday season, people are having fun, you know. Well, there's a few cues as well. But there's, of course, also our histories, of course, the Gokuraon, the genocide, um, and other hidden histories, which I, I discovered through my own parents, my own mother, you know, when I just started asking her about that period. And you see things that are beneath the surface that are not so apparent, um, at least when I was growing up. So it's a very fascinating place in that way. Talking about growing up, take us to your early childhood. Where did you grow up? I'm in Bulawayo, Richmond. My mother was a teacher in Northley High School. Um, so she was a single parent. My father lived overseas, was a lawyer in Rome, but he passed away when I was young. So, yeah, I founded SOS, him and Kamani Primary School. Then in high school, I was girls' college. Um, so I'm born and bred. I was an only child till I was 13. So I'm now a little, a younger sister. Um, but growing up, so we were a family of, I think many families here, because even when I went to Lopengula, to Malumami, you'd see books. There were books everywhere. My grandfather was a district administrator at Lupane, Lupane district. So he had the library where you'd find all sorts of books um, from Amandebele, Paysetters, Westerners, um, Otto Skoyevsky. You'd find books from everywhere. So even in my house, Akulas Namapu. So I think that's where my love for reading started. Pascal, this is a person who grows up with people who are like, you know, liking to read mm -hmm. the books. At what point do you say, you know, I, I think I want to be an author? I think, yeah. Um, I, see, I, 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 think, I mean, when I was nine, I started writing stories when I was young. I was saying Tato Cousin Ram, and I'd force them to try and act out his stories. I mean, when I phone me. So I was that sort of child. Um, but you know, e writing, like, as I, it was not something I thought I could pursue as sort of a profession, I suppose, a vocation is more like it. Um, and then I got involved with the British Council. There was a project, uh, in the Echoes of Young Voices. That's where I met Wutu, Wutu Lezu yeah, yeah. Um, also a facilitator. He, was facil he was the facilitator for that project, and he helped to edit. And we went to my workshops with the likes of Christopher Mdalazi, you know, our, own, our very own um, local writer. Um, so that's where actually I started getting groomed or got, got really this idea of being serious. This is the, this. I remember the project very well. Yeah, Kumbula. 2010, 2011. Well, 20, yeah, 20, yeah. 20, yeah, 20, yeah, 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 yeah. So that was, we had, we had a first book 2007 and, and then a second book 2009. 
It's the first time published. And you know, we had, we had writers as young as 12 to about 24. So I was 19 at the time. So that sort of grew me. Um, were interested in writing. Uh, but then I sent Chimamanda Adichigu TV. I saw her on BBC Hot Talk Extra one day. This was in around July 2007. I just saw her on TV. And I was, uh, you know, very surprised to want a young African woman, a Kulumang Okbala, you know, something she was doing. So I remember <laughs> it was the time of my shortages. And so I sent Boni and I really wanted to read that book, but I didn't have access to it. So Ngam Balela. And she, she responded. So that was also sort of my taste of, you know, what, what writing, what one can do with the writing. And at the time, I, I was doing a, a architecture and asked. And, you know, I was very young, very spirited. I quit, I quit architecture. I, but it wasn't for me. But uh, I was only doing it for, I'd been doing it for a semester. And I quit, but because I felt this is not what I want to do. Um, but I wasn't sure how I want to get into writing. So it's been, I must stops and starts, fits and starts, you know. So how do you finally make it through for, for this book? What, I mean, what was the breakthrough? How was it like? Um, oh, House of Stone. Yeah, well, I found myself in South Africa. So I started study economics. So my first degree is in economics and finance. And even then, by the time I finished that degree, I knew. So it's like trying and error. I tried the architecture. I've actually finished the economics. This is not my thing. And I was writing throughout. And I think what helped me were also sending work out. And then um, 2009, I won in Dwasa short story writing competition, our very own Bulari competition, right? It's now known as the Yvonne Vera Award after the great writer Yvonne Vera. So win winning that award, I remember I'm the youngest recipient ever of that award, only 21, young, it really got me excited. So in Jalo really motivated me. Uh, but I think I've, I would always have been writing. It's Gucci writing is one thing, publishing is another. Um, and then go undergrad when I was doing economics, I wrote a book of Tango Shadows, a collection it's published in South Africa. And it's about Zimbabweans in Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans in Joburg, you know. Going to Johannesburg was a shock for me. I was young, first time away from home, and um, you see both the glids, but then says one there's just diversity, but also you know, it's very creative, very you know, things like that. So that's what Ushatos is about. Um, and at that time, actually, ooh, House of Stone came out of that. Going to South Africa, suddenly that's when actually, you know, suddenly we were Zimbabweans and, you know, we were ostracized, you know, and there was this feeling of not feeling at home. Also, of course, this feeling, but you also, home is here in Zimbabwe. And at that point, I think I started trying to figure out, to, you know, what is home? I think I was quite angry or feeling dislocated. Um, like, why do I have to be here? You know, you know we, we didn't leave by choice. My family left in 2009. My, my mom, well, she was a government teacher, so by then things were really really bad. Um, so we moved to South Africa. And even then, it's hard to settle in. It's hard to start afresh, you know. So that anger. So I just started trying to think back to our history. And I, then I thought, which years is growing up in Matevele land, is it in Debele? I've actually never felt a part, like a part of Zimbabwe. And why is that? So these were the questions that I just started asking. Why have I not felt a part of this place? Where is home? What is home? Um, and I just, I love history. Just for pure pleasure of it, I just started reading up about our history. Um, I'd find my online articles, um, there were some books of its university, um, I found some novels, and then I started asking my family members, and they would, you know, Likula, you know, Wawunjan. By the time I was born, I was 88, but growing up, my mother was now a city woman, right? But Wakulele Kaya, and she was a teenager during the Liberation War, something I'd never thought about. And then she was 2021 20, when Ikuku Raundi started, right? So these are other lives that she has lived I had never thought about. And because, I don't know, um, I know talking to you earlier, um, City, your family, people talked about these things. In my family, we never spoke about Ikuku Raundi. I have an uncle, very successful, you know. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if you edit this. He doesn't like Hamashona. And so growing up, I was always trying to figure out why, why, you know, why? And then when I was trying to find out about this issue from my mom, I asked him about Chikoku Raundi. He got so emotional. 
and he's not an emotional person, so very, you know, yeah. he got very emotional and he couldn't speak. And then he was explaining to me, Oguti, it was Eluveve um, during, the geno during the genocide. And it was some Siawa Masocha, and they had to, there was like an underground bunker from one of, one of his uncles who had fought in the Liberation War, and they had to hide there. So, you know, but that's the only thing he told me, but he got very, very upset. So things like, suddenly you start seeing things on you. And my own mother, you know, she was actually eager to talk about the Liberation War. I guess out of nowhere, you know, like, I had never really thought of some implications, seriously. So, freezer. Then she snapped. Oh, what? I'll tell you, uh, you know, we'll talk about it some other time. No, press, I know, you know, what are you, I'm thinking, you know, then I noticed, oh, I've, I've hit something. The moment that happened, I became so interested in, in Kukurawundi. It became actually, for me, it, 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 those reactions told me, which actually, this is not history, as in it's not past. It's, yeah. there's still something. And really, that's what I, I sort of picked up on it. And that's why it's set in 2007. And there's an talk as a secessionist movement in it. It's, it's, it's set in the present because it felt to me that that history is not. It's too expensive. You can't buy it and pay $3.50. What is happening? We don't understand. Oh, you got the thirty-five dollars. I tell you, seventy-nine dollars. Welcome to Community Conversations with me, Shmuel Mkalo. Thank you so much. I'm very pleased to what you are saying. Nasunu kaba pen. Because at least he was better. He could control the prices. Control the prices. Cut it. Ah, the pocket. He's just good at it. So if you go take a walk, but I'm going to go talk about or your 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 Nabukosi who disappears after going to a secessionist party mm -hmm. and you know you're talking about you know secession has been the talk of this part of Matebelelen mm -hmm. but that, then there's also the part of Kukuraundi. Mm -hmm. Do you so do you see secession mm -hmm. as the cause or why the people of Matebelelen oh, are not uh, you know really feeling part of Zimbabwe? Definitely, definitely. I mean you you cannot separate um you call for secession or even need devolution from is a Bapa's original sin, which is Ikukurawundi. Um, you know, I mean, the village, you, can, you actually can't talk about one without talking about the other, which becomes a problem, right? Because I'm a, a, secession, I'm a secessionist sister, always seen as, a, you know, these thugs, these radicals. But what, what's the root cause? Um, but it's, you know, I mean, I want to, you know, Ikukurawundi and then Gwabale in 1987 Unity Peace Accord. If that had been genuine, you know, we should have seen it development in our and also our um, reparations, um, and uh, you know, which is a desire to really reinstitute our material and it's part of the Zimbabwe. But that never happened, and that's why you know, each genocide is it's not one event; it's not the past. Look at Quebec. I, I, it feels your, your, so. your story is uh, fiction, mm -hmm. yes. but uh, based on history. Yes. I mean, what was your? I mean, what made you to decide that uh, you know the kind of to say you are telling a Zimbabwean story, mm. but uh, using you know fictitious current. Fictitious. You know, so you know, with the fiction, one thing that's interested is in Ubuntu, Ubuntu, your humanity. So, the basic questions um, that I start with when I'm writing, for example, Uzamani, Mubani, Uzamani, who are you? What motivates you? Right, and you find there are many things that motivate Uzamani besides the history. Desire for revenge, confusion. Um, there's also, you know, isolation. There's love. There's ambition. Um, so it's the same thing. There's Kato Tamutumo, who's the leader of the secessionist movement. So in, in fiction, um, which would be different from, say, nonfiction or even a documentary, it's, 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 it's very like, oh. But documentary is quite similar. I think it's like, oh, Mubani Dumo, you know, Uvela Ngaki, and what's motivating me. So that's the basic question we start with, that I start with. and. So it's for me to unravel, to find out who these people are, these little people in history. Because one of the things with our history in Zimbabwe, it's always the big people who are the history makers. And I think that's what makes it easy for us to dehumanize, for example, Ama, 
abantu wenzi kukura hundi. They're always who background. Yet bring just bringing people's lives into the forefront, and not just e genocide. So there is a early on 1976. So say Rhodesia goes back to Skatska Queen Lozike. You know, so there are these characters who are telling each other my histories, right? The oral, which is how I, we know we, that's how I grew up. That's how I got my histories. You know, tell me what happened. Um, and for me, it's also to show a lineage, right? Right from Iskatska, you know, Olopengula. Um, and in the 80s, part of trying to restitute uh, ourselves from colonialism was to get our traditions and our, our identity back. It starts there. Then the, you can see the genocide in that long lineage. It also <laughs> crushes, subverts that building, that anti-colonial spirit, aren't you? So I want, I really was, as I was reading back in history, actually, you start seeing our connections. That's how it's, the book started. Would you look at Kalisa movie? I said, ah, can you look at Gwenza? I'm going to get connected. I'm going to get connected. So yeah, so that's the sort of, so if characters know, falling in love, getting married, interesting, just in Pilo, right? You, 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 you're born a year after the unit accord. And uh, you know, yet that story, mm. uh, it seems mm. like, it happened uh, yesterday. Mm. Mm. And I mean, you've gone through high school, mm. you have a year of experience. Do you feel our schools, our history, really talks about this said, uh, chapter of Zimbabwe? Oh, no. Andrew, really, right? They cut it. Andrew, I remember learning, they cut that part of history. They never really spoke about it. Um, but I mean, the, the, even the greater sort of sadness for me, I never knew about Queen Lozike until I left school. And then I realized the Battle of Galade. Uh, in the 1890s, the Battle of the Red X, right? First resistance against some colonialists led by Pindos Gay in our Ndebele culture. It's the first Chimuru Ngagane Handa, which is the national history. So you'll find again, so it was, but it's the very same incident, Ega Queen Lozike. So you find, oh, our history has been buried also. Um, if, if you find we're fighting right, colonialism, this is told over to, even in our post colonial moment, our culture is also now. Subverted under <clears throat> it called the Shona hegemony, which is what it is really, right? The the national history is the Shona version of history, but you know we have our own. Um, so so such things were fascinating, but also a bit saddening. How can I grow up as Katsangelesi and only learn this now? You know, you find that uh, most of the times people talk about you know women as oppressed and, mm. and not. I mean, if you read history, mm. women are really not mentioned. But mm. you talk about uh, Queen Dozike. Mm. You talk about, if you talk about Queen Nyamazan, mm. Queen Nyamazan yes. is actually in charge of. Uh, you know, I, I think that history is like probably misrepresented. Mm. Queen Yamaza yes. is in charge of uh, destroying the royal estate. Mm. And uh, then you have Queen Dos Gay. But even if you go to the liberation struggle, you mm. find people like Jane, uh, Nube, and many mm. other women. Mm. But they are not mentioned, these mm. people, in, 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 in history. Mm. You know, mm. uh, Do you think there will be a time when you know, the history, the role of women, will be properly yes. documented? Yes, definitely. I think uh, if we have more people, um, I think, like you and me, just searching for history, too, right? It's all about your interest. That's, that's, that's definitely the case. But that's a very sharp thing. If Puduwit, it's all in the telling. They get buried in the telling. Um, so for instance, Queen Lozike is a focal point who, in, the novel, in the terms of a symbol, she becomes symbolic even for the Mtaga Secessionist movement, you know, by a big, lovely poster of her as part of. So they're not actually paying tribute to Lopeng, unless to Queen Lozike. I, I had fun with that one. So um, I think, yeah, it's, it's in uh, unearthing these narratives. They're there. Um, it's, it's just having the resources, the time. Um, and for me, it's very important to develop people telling their history. You find a lot of our history, a lot of these nonfiction works are written by white South Africans, actually, and white Europeans. It's an industry, right? And they actually benefit from that. And I think it's time, Lati. We tell you know we tell our history the way we understand it. So you know people who talk about Kukurawundi most mm. of the times are, mm. are seen as uh, uh, tribalists, are seen as secessionists. The mm. times when I lose like two thousand followers a day because oh my goodness. I have, uh, I've, I've, I've mentioned something mm. that people think that uh, is, is tribalistic mm. or something like that. Mm. Did you feel that kind of you know anger or you know, people saying you're a tribalist by telling the story? And I've just had a push back a minimal, but I'm, I'm launching in Harare on Saturday, so we'll see what that's like. Um, 
Yeah, I've lost a few followers when I mentioned some of these things. But you know, what tribalism, you know, what, what, I feel like it's been a lot of misinformation. Maybe I believe in the goodness of people. I believe if people really understood what it was, they might see things differently. I think into a tribalism, you know, you're looking for trouble. Is it only thrives because there's just so many shadows around what really happened. Um, and for me, a good example of a sort of a model would be even Rwanda genocide, the way they dealt with theirs. You know, they actually had ama, even ama traditional courts, but they did not turn away from that. They really tried to find out what happened and to deal with it before moving on. They're genuine. So, so I, you know, I think Ogunye is just the uh, stereotypes, stories that become lies from retelling. Um, because there's so many myths around the around you. Even I, sometimes it's hard to figure out what's what. Uh, how long did it take you to, to write this book? Um, oh, six years. Six years. Um, because of a lot of the research, the reading, but also, I mean, m m much of this book takes place before I was born, right? And how do you deal with that? And how do you try and read up and show that time? And also trying to deal with something like Zimbabwean history. It's not a, it's not a small thing, right? So I'm Funuguchi. If this is done, I do it um, properly. And so in my mind, Villa was conversing with Lama Zimbabweans. It's, it's like a conversation. I don't think it's at all perfect, but it's something I'm passionate about, you know. So take us to the moment when the publisher tells you they've accepted your book <laughs> and they're going to publish it. Ah, Zemzele. Um, it took me a year to find a publisher for the novel. Um, for many reasons, because it's also set in Zimbabwe and they, you know, they wanted the book to be less, to be more readable for the international audience. You know, something I had to fight because this is about this is our history. It doesn't make sense. So, but when I found the the right editor who understood the book, who respected the book, who loved the book, I, I threw a party. It was the it was it's you know it's the moving from the writing stage to the publishing stage. It, it's an it's an amazing and equally important moment. But when you're writing, you don't think you don't think too far ahead to publishing. Otherwise, you won't finish writing, right? You also you need to get the story down as best you can before you start thinking of that. So looking at your experience, would you say it's, I mean, uh, how difficult or easy is it, is it to get such kind of stories out to the public? Um, hmm. In terms of publishing, you know, because it's published there, UK, Lay, USA, where my resources are sort of there, it was relatively more straightforward, right? Once I found the right publisher who understands and respects the work, um, that was really a straightforward process, I'm sure. In Zim, you know, I, I, had, I had actually in my mind this plan, which when it comes out in June, a UK, it will come out as Zim. But I couldn't, I mean, we have very few publishers here, like two or three, and I couldn't find a publisher for the book. Um, you have now written the book and mm. uh, the reviews, and mm. then how has been the response? It's been um, interesting, it's been good. Um, it's been. Um, I'm, I'm happy at least that there's, there's, a, there's engagement with the work, with its themes, with its topics, um, and also with its aesthetics, because it's also a literary work, right? It's history, but it's also an art. So it's, it's nice to have the art form of it also, the art of writing and creating also acknowledge. Um, but why I'm also here is to also get the book into the hands of Zimbabweans, right? They're also the people I'm interested in hearing from. <laughs> The cyberspace is home to billions of people and is the right platform you need to grow your business. The Center for Innovation and Technology is offering you a golden opportunity to speak directly to your market at an affordable price. We also offer media training workshops, live streaming, documentary production, and events management. Get in touch with us today on the following numbers. Plus 263-867-867. 7110290 or 0718100235. Don't forget to subscribe to our social media platforms. Like our Facebook page, Center for Innovation and Technology. Follow us on Twitter at SiteZW. And you can also check out our website, www.site.org.zw. You can also visit our offices at 45 Moffat Avenue, Hillside, Malawi. Take advantage of this opportunity to expand your business.
possible. So this book is published in June this year. A U K A. Um, a year after, I mean, almost months after Robert Mugabe <laughs> uh, left. Do you think that it contributed to, you know, uh, the success of the book, or mm. it wouldn't have mattered if Mugabe was if Mugabe was here? Do you think you'd be doing the launch here? <laughs> Probably not. Um, I might not be doing the launch if Mugabe was around. But you know, yeah, there was a moment during the coup when I, you know, you worried what's happening and how would it impact the book. Um, so I remember talking to my editor, and then that's, my editor is the one who calmed me down. You know, you know, fiction, fiction is timeless. You, 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 you could not have been writing towards this moment. None of us. I could never have seen a Zimbabwe without Mugabe. But I mean, when you see what happened afterwards, if you know Nangaka still denying the genocide. Um, but like we know we have all NPRC, we've had your documentary that caused quite a stir. Um, we had the commission about Amara Irish shootings that came here and Amara, um, you know, people hijacked that to talk about the genocide, right? Um, something happened in that moment with the coup that sort of, uh, there's so many conversations happening La Primitive Land about these issues, or at least I'm hearing more chatter than before, right? Which is not to say, and it's interesting, it's not to say to these things were not going on before, but somehow they're more, I think it's a bit amplified. So in a way, it's like, oh, this book found its moment unwittingly, right? Um, because Mugabe's departure seems to have opened up at least um, space for people to try and, you know, talk back to or shape Zimbabwe the way they wish it to be. So as an author, I mm. mean, what's, what does the future hold? Hmm. Um, I'm working on a, a, another novel right now. Probably going to take me a few more years. This one is set in America. It's probably, you know, being a diaspora. I'm reluctantly a diaspora. I've only been in America for six years. Um, I'm a reluctant diaspora. Um, so, I'm, you know, it's for me, diaspora, Zimbabwe, locals, and very interesting. Um, you find in places like Twitter, there are Gulama divisions. Yeah. But the way, I'm um, interactions, even the way things flow between the diaspora and locals. Like in Houston, there's a large Zimbabwean community in Salakon. It's, it's, it's a good community. It's, um, so, I'm really interested in that idea of being a diaspora Zimbabwean. Yeah. So, do you see yourself uh, coming back to Zimbabwe at one point? Like permanently? Yeah, I dream of it, you know. Um, I'm actually would be open to it. I'm, I in my mind actually I had staked so much on the elections in my. In, well, I'm like the ideal elections that. It's so I mean, uh, just on that mm. question, I mm. mean, in your mind, you're sitting in America. There's mm. an election in Zimbabwe. Mm. Uh, what was going through your mind? What were your possibilities of saying uh, if this happened, this mm. will happen? And then, uh, no, I, I I thought if for the first time we have a new party in power you know, other than the old dispensation. I, I mean, I think it's naive looking back that, that that could have been allowed to happen. But, you know, even dreaming, I thought it could open up so many avenues. And especially as one who's interested, say, in the genocide on history, um, we could actually have a space to talk about history here. And then also, because, you know, one of the things about the past is like, oh, it's, you know, we're focusing on the economy. Now I say, if you live in a place like America, history, knowledge is big business. It is big business, it also contributes to the economy. Um, so I was thinking, yeah, actually knowledge, knowing about history could be, become something that's also um, contributes to our lives here, yeah, right? But even without the economics, right? In changing, you know, I, I was following with Twitter, um, and that's where you, when your Twitter feed is quite helpful about, about this, you know, when I'm, uh, people went to try and pay their respects, and I'm a police, I stopped them. So in, in my vision, I thought in the, with new people in power could have a, a museum you know, Kukurandi means Kukurandi studies. Um, you know, because that's a very key part of our history that we, we seem to run away from. Yet, no, you know, facing it rather than looking away would shed light on so many other things. Even the Liberation War, right? There's so many stories from that era. There's so much actually trauma that we've gone through as a nation that we do not look at, right? So, I mean, you're launching a book uh, today mm. in Bulawayo mm. at the at the. At the uh, American space. Mm. Uh, what, what should people expect? Oh, um, it's it's for me. First of all, we are your home ground celebration. Second, it's a discussion. It's a frank discussion about the book and its themes um, between uh, me, myself and the audience, myself and Wuto, and anyone else who's interested. Um, so it's just um, sort of introducing the book to um, Zimbabweans, Bulawayans, and um, having a frank talk about. Um, what the book is about. Yeah, so lastly, when you sat down and wrote this book, mm -hmm. what were the objectives? What kind of 
issues did you want to tackle? You know, first I was tired um, of, you know, growing up so, the 2008, um, I remember the generals, one of them was Rupiri, if I'm not mistaken, came out on TV and they were threatening the country with war if you didn't vote the right way, right? So I, I think for me it was sort of speaking back, a different sort of Zimbabwe where we have what you call small people. So yeah, we just have more ordinary people living their lives and they're going through these situations and what happens. So it's really, for me, it's, it's talking back to that history or looking at a sort of different history. This is also, I, I call this my love letter to Zimbabwe, though it's biting, it's a biting, but um, it's, it's like a critique. It's a, it's a philosophical and also creative exploration. To you. What is Zimbabwe? When you say something called Zimbabwe was born and we are living in it and you are trying to negotiate in that space, what does that entail? And of course at the center of it, for me, Zimbabwe's original sin, the Kukurangi genocide. That was the book, uh, The House of Stone by Novuyo Rosa Chuma, uh, telling us or uh, talking to us about this uh, fascinating uh, history written in form of fiction. And I hope uh, today you'll be able to attend uh, the launch that will be happening at the American Corner. So I'm always excited when young Zimbabweans uh, go back to history and, and, and document some of these things. Because I think over the months, over the years, I've always said the problem that we have in Zimbabwe is we don't document our history. More so in Matewele, where you find that the story of Gukura Wendi, the story of Lobengula, the story of Sumsirigazi is told by some people and not us. And if you look at our Zimbabwean history, most of the times you would think that, uh, you know, Zipra never went to war. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to Marange at one point uh, to live stream an event and people talking. We keep on, uh, kept on talking about uh, uh, you are selling uh, this land like Lobengula sold Zimbabwe, you know, for sugar and all those kind mm -hmm. of things. So I think there are so many misconceptions about Zimbabwe. There are so many misconceptions about the liberation struggle. And there are so many misconceptions about Kukura only. Over the years, we have told by a lot of lies, uh, by the people who are in power today, the people who were perpetrators of the Kukura only. And to a certain extent, they managed to uh, try and cover up their history. Mm -hmm. Because for the last 36 years, very few people could talk about Kukura only, and people would only whisper. And up to now, there are some people who think that if there was no Kukura Wundi, we would not be having uh, Zimbabwe today. But mm. uh, I believe they, they, they tried using misinformation to actually cover up for the genocide. And it's, it's, I'm really excited that uh, young people have started to document this history, tell the stories, and because that encourages people to actually discover the part of history that they don't know. And it, with Zimbabwe, you're always learning something new that you, you don't know. There are so many secrets. I mean, I wonder if it was a family, how uh, this family would be like, because you're always getting new revelations every day. So mm -hmm. Zimbabwe has a lot of secrets. And I think one thing that I always encourage the new dispensation to do is to come out in the open and get a moment where they would say, let's tell the Zimbabwean story honestly and sincerely, then we can move forward. Because for now, it's just a joke. So this was an interview with uh, Novio Rosa Chuma. By the way, the ZANPF Congress is, or conference is also going on, and I hope in one of their agendas they will talk about uh, Gukura Wundi. Uh, it would be nice to see a resolution from a ZANPF conference to say we have agreed to talk about Gukura Wundi. So to those in Eskodini, uh, the challenge is to you to talk about uh, Gukura Wundi in your conference. Till you meet again, well, have a good day. My name is Anzal this one word, Kukura Wundi, you only have to say it slowly in order to understand its weight. Gu, that's a hard G, like go. And I can imagine her, my mama, as she went bundled into the back of a truck as a teenage girl with those like Mama Agnes from neighboring villages. My uncle Fanny by her side, my cousin Kohlwa with them, bundled by the men in the red berets with black Jesus leading the charge.